There are so many Muslims who have died and they are now in the grave. And now that they are seeing the realities of the hereafter with their own eyes, they wish, they wish that somebody alive would build for them a well or somebody would build for them an orphanage or somebody would give sadaqah on their behalf or do any good deed to benefit them now that they have died. These are the three short stories that I wanted to mention and now the question that poses itself is what is the link between them? And I am sure that you have gathered the link already. It is an unmissable link. Every one of these three companions, the moment they embraced the religion of Islam, they instantly said, what can we do to serve this deen? This was their very first question. There was no delay. Umayr ibn Wahab becomes Muslim. He said, send me back to Mecca to invite to Islam. There and then. At-Tufayl ibn Amr al-Dawsi embraces Islam. He says, send me back to my people at dawus I want to invite them to Islam. Thumamat ibn Uthal embraces Islam. He says, I'm going to Umrah to invite them to Islam. How many years have we been Muslims? Therefore, we ask, what next? What is our project in life? What is our strategy for the hereafter? What is the case that we will present to Allah to justify our tears for Jannah? What is our project in life? You see, brothers and sisters in Islam, every time we come to set a strategy for the Akhirah, Shaytan, he appears and he says, no, don't trouble yourself. Live as an average Muslim. Live to eat and eat to live. Live to work and work to live. Be a person who has no aims or objectives in his life. This is many Muslims. He, cre he creates hurdles and obstacles in your way. The moment you sit down to set a strategy for your Akhirah, for Al-Firdaus Al-A'la, the highest gardens of Jannah. He says, you can't do it. Here is an obstacle that he will present us with. Number one, he will say, you have no talents. You have no abilities. How can you leave a long lasting impression or influence anybody or anything? And you have nothing. Abu Mu'adh al-Razi, he would say, beware of allowing a bird to be better than you. What do you mean, O Imam al-Razi? He's talking about that bird that Allah Almighty mentioned in Surah Al-Naml that saw an entire community worshipping the sun besides Allah. So the bird became upset and it said, Allah yasjudu lillah, alladhi yukhriju al-khaba'a fi samawati wal ard Will they not prostrate to Allah? Will they not prostrate to Allah? Sulaiman alayhi salam, he was looking for this bird, it, has, it, it is missing from his assembly. He said, I'm going to torture it or kill it if it doesn't appear right now. Then the bird it arrived and it leveled its complaint to Sulaiman alayhi salam and it justified its absence and this complaint of the bird became the reason behind the entire community of the sun worshipping tribe embracing Islam with Sulaiman. The complaint of a bird. Therefore, Ar-Razi says, beware of allowing a bird to be better than you, O Muslim, a bird. It never justified its lack of contribution because I'm only a bird and I am weak. A person who says, I have no talents, I have no abilities to reform and to revive and to change and to influence. A person who says, I have no talents, he has shown very bad suspect in Allah. And he is accusing Allah of not giving him the resources needed to attain the highest grades of Jannah. This is su dhanin billah. This is very bad suspect in Allah. No, Allah has given you all of the talents that are needed. But sometimes what we do lack is the vision and the drive. So we have talents. What other obstacles are there? A second obstacle, shaitan will say the moment you start writing a strategy for your akhirah and a vision, shaitan will say, you are not a scholar. You're not a scholar. How will you be influential when your knowledge is next to none? Brothers and sisters in Islam respond to shaitan and let us say to him, how many of the Sahaba were scholars? How many? 
The Sahaba that changed the world in a few years, how many of them were ulama? Yes, Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman and Ali, they were ulama. Abu Musa al-Ash'ari was a scholar. Ibn Ummi Abd, Ibn Abbas, uh, Ibn Mas'ud and Ibn Abbas, they were scholars. Mu'ad ibn Jabal, Ubay ibn Ka'b, they were scholars. Our mother Aisha, they were scholars. But the majority of the companions were not scholars. A lot of them were ummi, illiterate. Who said you needed to be a scholar to change the world and to set a strategy for your akhirah? In fact, was Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu a scholar when he began giving da'wah the very next day after his shahada? Was he a scholar? At the time, he was not. Yet the very next day, he came back with Uthman ibn Affan ready to become Muslim. And Zubair ibn al-Awwam. And Talha ibn Ubaidillah. And Sa'ad ibn Waqqas. And Abdul Rahman ibn Awf. And the day after that, Al-Arqam ibn Abil Arqam. And others of the companions, the very next day. The very next day. Therefore, my brother, take the knowledge that is needed in order to excel in your strategy and fulfill your objective. But don't say, I have no knowledge. The Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would say, as Imam Al-Bukhari narrates in his Sahih, بَلِّغُ عَنِّي وَلَوْ آيَةٌ Convey from me, even if it is just an ayah. Convey from me, even if it's one ayah. Convey, this is taklif, an obligation. From me, this is tashrif, to honor the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. An ayah, one verse, this is takhfif, to lighten the boat, to the load. Taklifun wa tashrifun wa takhfif. Don't say, I have no knowledge. Finally, shaitan will also say to you, okay, fine, we have talents and I have some Islamic knowledge, but I am a sinner. I am upon serious sins, ya akhi Ali, behind closed doors. How can I influence and what type of hypocrite will I be? Now I tell you this, brothers and sisters, this type of mindset that says, I am a sinner, this is positive. It in of itself is not bad. It is required. يتوب على يدي قوم عصاة أخافتهم من الباري ذنوب وجسمي مظلم من طول ما قد جنى فأنا على يد من أتوب كأني شمعة ما بين قوم تضيء لهم ويحرقها اللهيب كأني مخية يكسو أناسا وجسمي من ملابسه سليب أبو المظفر محمد بن علي الدوري he would say that people are repenting to Allah through me but my heart is so dark, so who will help me repent? He says, I am like a candle showing people the way forward, but the candle itself is burning and melting. He says, I am like a needle and thread sewing the clothes for people, but my body itself is uncovered. So the mindset of I am a sinner, this is not bad. But when does it reach a level when you know it's gone too far? when you stop preparing for yourself a strategy for the hereafter and you become an average day-to-day -day Muslim because you are a sinner. This is when you know you have fallen into the traps of shaitan. And that is why Al-Hasan al-Basri, when he was told that there is so-and-so who is not doing any da'wah because he says, an aqula ma la af'al, I fear that I will say something that I am not doing. What did he say? He said, wa ayuna yaf'al ma yaqul. He said, he said, who of us does everything that he teaches? Who of us does everything that he teaches? This is shaitan's trick so that nobody enjoys good and nobody forbids evil. I close my brothers with two minutes and I will say the following. One of the Kuwaiti commentators of today, of our times, he said that it is only 2% of every nation that are leaders that are revivalists, that have strategies and plans for themselves and their ummah, they are only 2%. What about the remaining 98%? They are followers. Their sideline is they're watching. And when you look into the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ, you see the same thing. Almost the same percentage. How many companions were with the Prophet ﷺ in Hajjatul Wada'a, the farewell pilgrimage in the end of the seerah? Around 114,000 Sahabi. But how many Sahaba do we know them by name? Around 1,500 only. That is around 1.3% of the entire number of Sahaba who are with him. 1.3% we know their names. In the authentic ahadith, and the weak ahadith, and the fabricated ahadith, we only know 1,500 Sahaba. Why their names? Because they were the ones who came forward. 
They were the ones who put forward a strategy for their Akhirah. They were the ones who had a project for Jannah. That was them. I tell you this, my brothers and sisters. There are so many Muslims who have died. And they are now in the grave. And now that they are seeing the realities of the hereafter with their own eyes, they wish, they wish that somebody alive would build for them a well. Or somebody would build for them an orphanage. Or somebody would give sadaqah on their behalf or do any good deed to benefit them now that they have died. Don't be like this person. Waiting for other people to build your akhirah, don't be like this person. Rather, we have to step up and we have to build our own hereafter. Nobody will build your place in Jannah except yourself. What is your strategy in life? And how will you justify your tears in front of Allah for Jannah? What is your project that you will present to Him? Therefore, Ikhwani, and Akhawati, everybody must ask himself this question. I am a PhD holder in medicine, I am a doctor, so how do I prepare a strategy for Jannah bearing in mind my circumstance? I am young, I am old, I am an engineer, I am a student of knowledge. How will I prepare a strategy bearing in mind my circumstance? I am a mother, I am an orphan, I am a woman at home raising my children. What is my specific strategy for my akhirah?